Thank you. Uh, Hi, uh, it's my pleasure to be here today to uh, present our work published in the November issue of PNAS last year and uh, about constructing networks. So first, uh, an overview slide of uh, what uh, I'm going to present today. We, uh, we are going to present a new method to infer networks that uh, in integrates external data sources and as well as allowing for feedback loops in the network. And uh, as in addition to uh, method development, we also generated new data, a new data resource, profiling the time series expression data in genotyped uh, yeast strains in response to a drug perturbation. And uh, highlights of our results, uh, our method produced some regulatory relationship that's consistent with what's known out there. And uh, we also discovered new things and we, selective, we selected certain new predictions with high confidence and prospectively validated some of them. And uh, as a follow-up to our work published in PNAS, we developed a new method that incorporates prior probabilities. And we show that our new method works even better than our uh, published method. And uh, to compare with uh, what's out there in the literature, we also applied our method to our published data and show that our method works well. So now I'm going to go into the details of uh, some of this work. So first, uh, the data that we have uh, generated is the time series expression data. Our goal is to capture large changes in expression levels. And in order to do that, we have two experimental design, we have two goals in mind. First, uh, as the title of the talk suggests, we want to capture time dependencies, so as to order regulatory events. And uh, after yesterday's uh, afternoon's keynote talk, I don't think I need to go into why we would like a time series expression data. And then the second experimental design we would like to have is to have to be able to leverage on genotype data so that we could correlate DNA variations with the observed expression changes. Um, so with these two goals in mind, we um, took two yeast strains. One is a lab string, the BY string, and a wild yeast string called RM. And these two strings have been previously crossed to produce uh, roughly 100 segregants. And the beauty of these uh, parental strings and the segregants is that they have been previously genotyped. And the genotype data is publicly available. So what we did is we took these parental strings and the, and the roughly 100 segregants and we subjected them to a drug perturbation and observed the expression changes over time. And the drug we have chosen is called rapamycin. Uh, we chose rapamycin for two reasons. A, it's easy to implement in the lab, so uh, our research scientists could generate uh, the data happily. And two, it's because rapamycin induces large expression changes um, in a lot of genes. So, um, and over the, the time points, we have a total of six time points uh, over at 10 minutes intervals. So uh, we have used uh, almost 600 FMetrix microarrays to generate this data set. And this data set has been deposited in the Array Express database with uh, this um, accession number. In order to infer networks uh, using our time series data, we developed a new method. Our idea is to use the expression level at the previous time point to predict the expression level at the current time point. So um, for each gene G, we are trying to find potential regulators, Rs, from the previous time point T minus one. And um, mathematically, if we let X to be the expression level of gene G at time T in segregant S, uh, we can write this expression level as a linear combination of the expression level of a regulator R at the previous time point T minus one in the same segregant S. And uh, the way uh, with this formulation, we are going to apply a variable selection method to infer the candidate regulators, R's here, and also to compute the regression coefficients, beta. And I'm going to say more about uh, the variable selection method in just two slides. But for now, um, let's focus on how we find the candidate regulators, R. So without any prior knowledge, if we don't any, know anything else, every gene is a potential regulator of every other gene. 
and what we want to do is we want to constrain our search to the most likely regulators. And the way we do that is we are going to integrate additional data sources to guide our search of likely regulators, of candidate regulators. So uh, we have developed a supervised framework to integrate external data sources. And at the center of it is the, the training step in the supervised um, approach. So in the training data, uh, the rows are transcription factor gene pairs and the columns are different variables that we computed using different external data sources. And uh, so for the, um, the transcription factor gene pairs, we have positive training samples and we have negative training samples. So for the positive training samples, which is Y equals one, we got those from East databases. And, uh, and for the negative training samples, unfortunately, uh, it's very difficult to publish negative results. And there is no database of negative results. So what we did is we generated um, random transcription factor gene pairs, and we made sure that uh, those are not documented anywhere in any databases. Um, and we have roughly 500 positive training examples and roughly 500 negative training samples. And now we are trying to compute the um, uh, the independent variables, the XIs, that capture the evidence of regulation. So how do we do that? It's, this is where the external data sources come in. So for example, for each transcription factor gene pair, uh, with the expression data, we would compute the correlation between this uh, transcription factor A and gene B. And then uh, for, we also use genome-wide finding data, chip-chip data. To, uh, the idea is we want to see if transcription factor A binds to the upstream region of gene B. And in this case, we use the p-value from the chip-chip data to uh, measure the strength of binding. And we also look at co-citedness in the literature. So if gene uh, transcription factor A and gene B are co-cited, then we define a uh, binary variable to be one, otherwise it's zero, et cetera, et cetera. We have uh, roughly 20 uh, such independent variables. And now after we assembled the training data, we use logistic regression to uh, determine the weight of each of these uh, independent variables, the XIs, the evidence of regulation. After we define these weights, we can use these weights and apply them in the test phase of the supervised step uh, to compute this big matrix. I, I don't have much space to uh, draw a matrix big enough uh, to scale. So, but this is a 3,500 by 3,500 matrix. And uh, our data, the East time series data we generated has roughly 6,000 genes, and we filtered down to roughly 3,500 for genes that vary over time uh, or vary over the segregants. And then in the test phase, we apply um, the, the weight we determine in the training step to the uh, 3,500 by 2,500 matrix and to compute the probability that a given regulator R uh, regulates a gene G. And now, as promised, we are going to talk about the variable selection step. We chose a multivariate variable selection method called Bayesian model averaging, called BMA. Uh, most model selection approaches select one model and then proceed as if that model generates the data. That usually leads to overconfident inferences. In our context, a model is a set of candidate regulators. And what BMA does is it takes model uncertainty into account by averaging over the posterior distributions of many different models and um, weighted by their posterior probabilities. So if we look at uh, the probability of a quantity of interest, delta given the data D, we sum over uh, K. Model MK is a set of model, is, is a model MK. So we uh, take the uh, pro posterior probability of the quantity of interest given data D and model MK, multiplied by the posterior probability of model MK given D. So this is essentially the weight in this weighted average calculation. The idea is that a model MK that fits the data well is going to have a larger weight. So this is essentially a weighted average approach. In the interest of time, I'm not going into details how we computed uh, these uh, posterior probabilities, but I can assure you we have a pretty efficient way to do it. So it's not going to take you all day. 
and uh, BMA has been developed uh, for social sciences application, not for high dimensional analysis. We have previously extended BMA to a method called iterative BMA, IBMA, that, so that we could use it for high dimensional data in which we have more variables than observations. And what we get is from IBMA is that we'll get posterior probabilities for the selected genes and selected models. And then we threshold these probabilities uh, to define the edges in the network. And remember, we do uh, the variable selection for each gene in, in, in order to infer the network. This is a summary slide of our method. Um, so we have we used a supervised approach to integrate various uh, external data sources to compute the probability of regulation between regulators and genes. And then we use this probability to constrain our search of regulators. So for each gene G, we are trying to find regulators R with high probabilities from uh, the supervised step. And then this is where the variable selection, IBMA, comes in. And we apply IBMA to the time series expression data. But before IBMA, we uh, already got uh, only a instead of using all possible 3,500 regulators, we focused on those with high probabilities from the supervised step. To assess our network, we use two main ways. One is uh, the inexpensive way, which is recovery of what's already known out there in the literature. And uh, so we, we uh, came up with an independent assessment criteria from the literature that we did not use in uh, any of the external data sources or in the uh, variable selection step. And we have chosen to use the uh, East Tract database, uh, which gives us curated uh, information of regulatory relationships between transcription factors and genes. To avoid bias, we have subtracted those positive training examples we used in the positive, uh, in the supervised step. And then the more expensive way to assess our network is to uh, do generate new data, and we're going to talk more about that later. In order to quantify the association between the network we inferred and the assessment criteria, we use a contingency table approach. So uh, after we applied our uh, regression-based method, IBMA, to the time series expression data, we created a network that we are going to call Network A, which contains 3,500 nodes and uh, roughly 65,000 edges. And so uh, in this contingency table, the rows represent the edges in our inferred network. And the columns are the transcription factor gene pairs in the East Track database, which is our independent assessment criteria. And what we are looking at here is between the two yeses, the 662 represents the number of edges in our inferred network that agrees with East Tract. And then here we are looking at the fraction of these edges that are supported by East Tract, which is 662 divided by the row sum here. You would probably notice the row sum is a lot smaller than 65,000 edges. The reason it being that East Tract is incomplete and also it only documents relationships between transcription factors and genes. But when we constructed Network A, we did not have the same constraint. We also computed the chi-square statistic and the corresponding p-value for this contingency table as well. And now are the more expensive way to evaluate our networks. We generate new data. The idea is that if we look at our, the inferred network, if we perturb the parent nodes, if we change the expression, if we change the expression level of the parent node, we would expect the expression level of the, the child nodes to change as well. And so uh, this is what we are thinking about. So what we did is we tried to do deletion experiments uh, using some selected parent nodes. And we have selected three transcription factors, uh, which are ARO80, DAT1, and RTG3. The reason we suggest, uh, selected these three are uh, mostly because uh, all three of them have uh, a high number of child, uh, a large number of child nodes at high confidence uh, inferred from our network. And also they have uh, different uh, known characteristics in the uh, bi biology literature. And so we used the deletion strings of these three transcription factors. We uh, did the rapamycin perturbation. We waited 50 minutes. And so uh, these are the deletion experiments we have done. And we did three uh, replicates. 
and we compare to the background string, the wild type in this case is the BY uh, parental string, and then we are uh, to find the genes that respond to the deletion under the rapamycin perturbation. We find the differentially expressed genes using uh, standard methods out there. And then we compare these differentially expressed genes to the child loops of our selected transcription factor. And note that this is just an approximation because uh, when we perturb the parent loops, we would also um, expect to see changes in the children of the children as well. But here we are only comparing the immediate child loops to the differentially expressed genes. And uh, for the deletion data we have generated, we have uh, deposited the data in array express as well. So these are the results for arrow 80, one of the three transcription factors we have chosen. Arrow 80 has 51 child nodes at a very high posterior probability uh, in our inferred networks. And among these 51 of them, four of them overlap with the differentially expressed genes. These are shown in green. And then uh, when we computed the p-value uh, of the corresponding contingency table, comparing the genes from the differential, uh, from the deletion experiments, and then the uh, child nodes from our network, we get a significant overlap here. And um, so, and, and after we generated these results, we went back to SGD and also to look at the literature. And we uh, find that uh, arrow 80 is a known regulator for arrow 9 and arrow 10. Probably the name means that should tell us something. And for the other two, NAF1 and ESBP6, uh, the binding uh, of arrow 80, uh, the binding has been supported by independent chip chip data that we did not use in the external, we did not use in the method as well at, at all. So which is good. And we have also done binding site analysis. Arrow 80 has a known binding site from Jasper. And so uh, what the, the pink uh, nodes here are the target genes with the known binding site upstream. And uh, the four overlap here are shown with the uh, square or the rectangle. So what, um, to our relief, all four genes that respond to the deletion contain the known binding sites upstream, which is a good thing, which is, um, makes me very happy. And then for the other results for that one, uh, that one has 57 child nodes in our inferred network, network A. And out of 57 of them, 20 of them overlap with the genes that respond to the deletion of that one under the rapamycin perturbation. And then uh, this is the p-value of the um, comparing uh, the association between the differentially expressed genes and um, the child nodes. And because that one does not have a known binding site um, from Jasper, what we did is we took these 20 genes and then we retrieved the upstream uh, region of these uh, 20 genes and then we uh, run MIM. And this is the um, putative binding site that we have uh, inferred. And uh, this binding site is um, robust with respect to using different parameters in MIME. And uh, to follow our work, we have developed a new improved method that uh, is called IBM A prior that is currently under review. Most of this work uh, was done by my ex postdoc uh, Kenneth Lowe. And so this is IBM A is the method we have uh, published in PNAS. So both methods uh, uses a supervised approach use a supervised approach to integrate external data sources. And in IBM A, what we did is for each gene, we took the top 100 candidate regulators from the supervised step, and then we run IBM A. The, what that results is, is all the regression coefficients in the regression-based approach were computed using the time series expression data only. But in IBM A prior, we made two main extensions. First is we corrected for the sampling by rates between the positive and negative training samples in the supervised step. Uh, this is because in practice, we expect positive regulatory relationships to be a lot rarer than the negative, um, uh, than the negative regulatory relationships. So we used uh, the methods uh, used, um, employed in case control studies in epidemiology. Um, we used those methods by adding an offset uh, that corrects for this um, bias in the logistic regression approach. And then the next step is after we calibrated our pro probabilities of regulatory relationships from the supervised step, 
we incorporate these prior probabilities in the variable selection step. This is why we call this method IBMA prior. It's IBMA plus the prior probabilities. The intuition is that we want to favor the models that contain a lot of the regulators that are supported by the external data sources. And the end result is that the regression coefficients are computed using both the external data sources and the time series expression data. Um, now our results. So the second row in this table correspond to network A. This is the results you have previously seen in that contingency table slide. And then the first row here are the results from IBM A prior. So out of all these methods um, I present here today, only IBM A prior uh, uses prior probabilities in a regression step. And as we could see, IBM A prior uh, gives a higher fraction of genes supported by East Track than uh, network A. And without using any information from the external step, uh, from the external data sources, we do a little bit worse. And if we just correct it for the sampling bias without incorporating the prior probabilities in IBM A, we don't do as well. So this is kind of in between these two. And we also compared IBM A with other well-established variable selection methods like Lasso and least angle regression. And um, they, so these are directly comparable with these and IBM A does a little bit better. We also compared our method to uh, a published, but we also applied our method to a published data set that does not contain um, time points. And then, uh, so, and, and these are the, uh, the results that we got. And uh, IBM A prior does the best, followed by IBM A. And then uh, this is a, a leading method in the literature that has been shown to outperform our Bayesian networks. And uh, a summary, a recap of our, what we have done. We have generated a new resource profiling the time series expression level of a lot of uh, genotype East crosses in response to a drug perturbation. And, and our results uh, show that our methods produce relationships that's consistent <coughs> with what's out there. And some new, among the new relationships, uh, some of them we have prospected a selected subset of them, and uh, the results are looking good. And our new method, IBM A prior, that incorporates prior probabilities works even better. And then our method is competitive with uh, what methods out there in the literature. And recently, we are also working on a software implementation of our method, uh, in our package called Network BMA, that we have just submitted to Bioconductor last week. So if you're interested in IBM A and IBM A prior, uh, look for Network BMA in Bioconductor. I don't know when it would appear, but hopefully soon. And finally, uh, my thank you slide. And, uh, Hey, that was a great talk. Um, Thank you. I, I just had a question about your false positive rates, especially in the figure that you showed there. So obviously it's significant and I like the, the validation that you've done there. Could you speak a little bit about the nodes that were not validated, the child nodes that were not validated and maybe some of the reasons why that might be the case? Um, so um, y yes, uh, some of them do uh, many. So uh, the, I think uh, one of the reason is that uh, they are, uh, one of the reasons is the difference between the segregants. So when we did the deletion experiments, we are comparing the uh, deletion string to the wild type, in our case it's the BY string, and we are ignoring the variation in the other parental string, RM. I think that's one of the reasons. And the other reason is the time point. We are, in order to, uh, we don't have a lot of resources to do the deletion experiments at every time point. We only did it at 15 minutes, so that's another reason as well. Hi, great talk. Um, I had a question regarding the candidate regulators that you compute. Uh, are they the same for all time steps or uh, you have like also dynamic features in your table that you were talking about that that's, causes change? That's a good question. So in the supervised step, we did not account for time points at all. Okay, so, so only in the variable selection step. Okay. I also had a question about select, selecting the candidate regulators. Did you consider all of the regulators as regressors or only those that show chip-chip binding? We, uh, we used all possible regulators. 
and then uh, for those that have chip chip binding, they are favored because they get more weight in the supervised step. Right, but if you consider all of them, how do you test whether um, you're capturing direct bindings and causality as opposed to correlation from indirect, bi indirect regulations? That's a good question. So in the supervised step, uh, we, uh, we incorporate many da different data sources. So we are hoping that uh, by incorporating, uh, so for example, uh, uh, data sources like co co the literature citation, the co-citedness, may not capture direct binding. But we are hoping that uh, data sources, information from chip chip data, and also we uh, use uh, the gen genotype data and the uh, sequence polymorphism between the two parental strains. So with all these information put together, uh, we, we believe that what we got is pretty good, but we don't guarantee that it would 100% capture only the uh, direct relationship. So, um, question somewhat related to that. Do you allow genes to regulate themselves? Uh, yes, in the time series data, yes. Okay. Um, another question I had is, have you tried your method on organism other than yeast? Not yet, but we are going to. Okay. And uh, we are going to start a new collaboration, and uh, we are going to work on uh, some prokaryotes as well as uh, Great. eukaryotes. Thanks. <laughs>